thanks. Um, it's sort of appropriate that I'm talking about warping because my slides are warped a little bit. Um, so I hope it, it doesn't affect anybody. But I noticed um, today that I didn't have a very detailed description of my background or where I'm from. Uh, so I thought I'd stick in something about the author and just, just communicate to you guys that my background's basically computer science. I'm not a meteorologist. Um, any of the views that I'm pushing out there are my own. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I've been involved with Python probably um, from, from my postdoc days in medical imaging uh, up until recently when I became a Python developer at BOM. Um, but before that, I was very much into computer vision, face recognition, and um, modeling of human faces. And that's me when I had a mohawk a couple of years ago. <laughs> so back to the weather, I guess. Uh, this is a talk about manipulating uh, weather field data. Uh, and uh, the context of, of this talk will, will be really around um, how we're trying to make things easier for a forecaster. Um, at the Bureau, generally, there are a few really complex problems that are trying to be addressed. So, uh, you know, the, I tried to categorise these, and, you know, basically the first one that everybody knows about is numerical weather prediction. Um, that's been developed for very, very, very many years now, and it's just getting more complex. So we're getting to a position where we're trying to describe physical uh, properties at uh, scales that we previously couldn't even try to, to model before because we've got bigger supercomputers and we've got um, more complex understandings of the physics. Uh, then we also have the additional problem of actually trying to make decisions based on this data, so aggregating all of this numerical weather prediction data. That's what a forecaster does. A forecaster is the human computer that makes the decisions about forecasts and issuing warnings and things. Um, and then you've got this additional problem again of forecast systems, so enabling forecasters to actually do that. And that's sort of the category um, that I'm falling into. Generally, I'm working in forecast systems and we're responsible for, you know, generating, manipulating and visualising the guidance that goes to forecasters. So, um, just to try and motivate um, the problem, uh, I'm going to be looking at a case study which was Cyclone Yazi. That was a tropical cyclone that hit northern Australia around February uh, this year. And it was a very big cyclone. And so I thought it'd be very interesting to talk about a very big cyclone in my talk. Um, the details are pretty impressive. It had, it had something like a sustained wind speed of 200 kilometres an hour. And um, wind gusts of almost, I guess, 300 or 285 kilometres an hour. So it was a, it was a real beast. So I talked about weather field warping and enabling forecasters and trying to help them make decisions. And um, really what this talk is about is about improving this concept of weather field interpolation. Uh, weather field interpolation is about estimating the unknown data points between the known data points. And so to motivate this with a real example, I've, I've just picked out some um, surface level pressure fields of Cyclone Yazi that are 20 hours apart. And I'm pretending that we don't have information between those 20 hours. In reality, we do. We, we, have, we have data and we have heaps of it about the cyclones when they're happening, but this is just a demonstration. So on the left, we've got the cyclone as it's approaching the land, uh, and I've called that T equals zero. And on the right, we've got the cyclone out in the ocean and that's t negative 20, so that's 20 hours away. And the goal of weather field interpolation is to say, what is the cyclone in between these two points? What does it actually look like if we don't have any information about it? So there's actually a few ways that you can solve this problem. You know, the cyclone field is just a scalar field. You've got two measurements of scalar fields. You can interpolate between them. You can perform a weighted average. So What's the advantage of doing a weighted average? Well, it's very straightforward, it's easy to understand, and it's extremely quick. What's the disadvantage of doing a weighted average? It introduces effects that aren't realistic. You might get the cyclone appearing in two spots of the image, for example. 
Um, what I'm talking about in this talk is using warping. So this is this idea of transforming the two data points to a similar midpoint and then doing the average. And the benefit of that is you get something that actually looks realistic. The, the, um, the actual problem with that is, well, it's pretty complicated to do. So implementing it in Python is basically what I'm talking about today. Uh, this is just a video to, to demonstrate, you know, really what we're getting at. So on the right, you've got this averaged or weighted averaged example, and it shows you that if we're trying to estimate these interpolated time points, really the stuff that we get in the middle isn't very realistic. It looks like we've got two cyclones. We get this dumbbell sort of appearance. Um, whereas if you use a, a morphing approach, which is on the left, you can see that the, the characteristics of the cyclone are maintained. Um, you can even see the intensification of the low as it approaches the land. Um, so generally, it's just a better, better approach, which is good because I developed it. Um, to, to bring this home a little bit more, um, you know, we really do have sample points in the middle. So we do know what the cyclone looked like at time point t equals 10. So let's actually have a look at the error that we get when we use a weighted average versus an advected weighted average, I guess you'd call it. Um, so really all I want to demonstrate is that if you looked at the midpoint here, like the, the middle graph, basically what we're looking at is our estimate of where the cyclone is at time point equals 10. If you look at the plot directly underneath it, what we're looking at there is the difference between our estimate and what the actual cyclone was, so the observed cyclone. And you can see that the error field looks more or less flat. Um, you know, there might be a slight peak where we've got the center just a little bit off. But if you compare that to the weighted average approach, you can see this sort of dumbbell in the error field. And that's basically saying that we've got the two centers actually present in the data. And so the error is actually quite high. So this is my one slide explanation of image registration. It is not adequate as an explanation of image registration. Um, but basically what I want to get across to you guys is that image registration, warping, and morphing, in my mind, they all basically mean the same thing. Now, when I wrote my PhD thesis, um, I think I got burnt pretty heavily for saying warping and, and morphing were the same thing, but I just don't care anymore. They are. <laughs> um, and, and the crux of, of the problem really here is to estimate um, deformation parameters that map one field to another field. And those deformation parameters come from a model. So you might say, I want uh, a shifting model that says, give me the amount of shifting from A to B um, and parameterize that as a displacement in X and Y. Or you might say, give me the amount of rotation, translation, scale, skew, and that forms like a six parameter model, which is an affine model that you try to estimate. You can take it even further and you can have um, nonlinear models. Uh, but basically, what it really, really boils down to is parameter search. So it's a nonlinear optimization problem. You're trying to find the parameters that maximize the similarity between your two images. And that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here. Uh, further on into the talk, I'll provide some reading material. If you guys are really interested in image registration, I suggest that you follow up that reading material and have a read. Uh, but for now, one of the key things that I really want to talk about is the, the core components of image registration, in my mind at least, boil down to three, um, three key ideas. And that's one idea that you've got a similarity metric. So you've got a way to measure how close two images are. Um, and that can actually be quite, quite naive. That can be very simple. It could be like the sum of absolute differences, for example. Um, and then you've got a sampler. And a sampler basically turns um, what isn't a continuous thing into a continuous thing. So, uh, you know, an image isn't a continuous function. Basically, if we want to sample an image at 0.2.5 uh, by 2.5, then we have to interpolate the points around it and say, that that pixel value is actually the sum or the weighted sum of its neighbors. And that's what a sampler basically is. 
Um, and then we've got the idea of deformation models. So like I was saying before, you could have a translation model, a shift, uh, sorry, which I call the shift model, um, or an affine model, or you know, a spline, or something like that, to, to give you some idea of how the field is moving. So I guess the good thing for everybody is that I just implemented this in Python. Um, and you don't really have to worry about the details unless you really want to. Um, basically, what, I, what I've gone and done is I, I started an open source project and I called it Python Register. It's probably not the best name for a, a Python package and it may change name in the future, but it's already got a little bit of um, contribution from, from people that are involved with a popular scikit called scikit image. <coughs> and um, uh, to, to sort of break it down into the things that we actually have implemented right now, I put this table up there, um, which, which basically shows the metrics that we have implemented. So we've got the, the really simple metric implemented, which is absolute differences. Um, we've got a few models, and I'm just talking about the green ones for now. I'll, I'll get to the red and the, and the orange ones in a sec. So we've got a basic shifting model, uh, an affine transformation model, and then we've got samplers. And all of these samplers, except for the spline sampler, are implemented using C-types. Um, so we've got a nearest neighbor sampler, a cubic convolution sampler, and we've also got um, the spline sampler, which is basically just pulling map coordinates out of SciPy's ND image library. Now, to explain uh, the red cells, Basically, I have a few wants. Like, I don't want to use simple similarity metric. I want to use more complex ones. So um, basically, if, if you go to the GitHub um, link, you can see that we're, we're posting tasks for the project. And these are sort of things that we want to have implemented. Um, so we've got some ideas about making more complex similarity metrics and wrapping them into the whole optimization process. Um, and examples of those could be normalized cross-correlation or computing the mutual information of the images to give you similarity. Um, the, the orange um, cells are things that I've had a crack at. So I've tried to implement a, um, a polynomial deformation model. It sort of works. Um, we also have a, a spline deformation model, which is supposed to be um, a good way of approximating the non-rigid motion that you could have if one image was like wobbling, for example, or a fluid. Uh, the two papers that are really driving a lot of the development I've put underneath, um, I can't emphasize enough that these are probably like the seminal image registration papers. So if you're interested in understanding image registration, what I strongly recommend is that you go and have a read of the um, Baker and Matthews paper and just, um, just have a flick through it. It's actually a five part series, um, <laughs> which is a little bit scary at first. But um, I think just if you read the first paper, you'll get an impression of how difficult the process actually can be. And really, um, I, I don't believe, aside from implementing like a nonlinear optimizer, it's, it's actually that difficult. Oh, and please, follow it on GitHub. So I wanted to have a few examples of how simple or hard it would actually be to to sort of glue my package together and, and actually implement some image registration. So hopefully in a second, I'm going to try and demo this. Um, but because my screen's a bit warped, it might not look that great. Um, the, the key idea here is that you, you import this um, Python register package, you import a metric, you import a sampler, and you import a, uh, a model, like a deformation model. And then you just glue them together. So we've got this top level register script, which is sort of like a, our glue for a registrator. Um, so in this case, I just wanted to point out that it's very simple. Um, and this is an example of performing an affine registration between two images. Uh, so in, in this case, it would be just a standard um, you know, image processing image that we've rotated by 20 degrees. Uh, and we form an affine registrator. We coerce the image data into what I call register data because I want to have a concept of um, both images and features in, imi in images. Um, and for that sort of concept to work, we've basically got a container for the image. Um, the other thing that 
is really important about having registered data is that um, it's very easy in image registration just to consider the image and the coordinates in the image as the pixels, but that's really wrong. You have to actually have coordinate spaces. So in the future, part of the work that we're going to really be tackling is really addressing the coordinates and doing that properly in Python and integrating that with the whole registration process. It's, it's basically a big no-no to do image registration assuming pixel coordinates are the coordinate system. Um, and then the final step is basically calling the, the top level register uh, method and, and running it. And there's a few methods on it so you can print out a verbose description of what's happening at every iteration, or you can print out um, a graphic by having a plot callback. I might escape out of this. My screen is super huge. Let's just see what happens. Okay, so I went to the complex demonstration first, which was a bit silly, but um, basically what I wanted to demonstrate here is that we've got the Python logo, that's the image. Um, we've got a deformed Python logo, that's called the template. What we're trying to estimate are the deformations between the image and the template, and that's visualized in the center here um, as a grid that's sort of changing shape. And the way or the, the driver for that change of shape is a cubic spline model, so it's a really it's a really uh, complex model. It might have like 100 parameters, for example, and we're just trying to find those parameters that minimize the difference between the image and template. Um, so this is a, uh, sorry, on the bottom um, right-hand corner is a demonstration of the error. So the, the nonlinear um, image registration component of this package really isn't finished yet, but this is just a demonstration that we're sort of getting somewhere with it and we can do very simple things at the moment. In the future, we want to be able to uh, sort of estimate large-scale deformations. I'll pull up a, um, a simpler example. Oop, here's the rotated Python logo. So it'll eventually get there, but basically this just shows a very simple affine relationship between the image and the template. And the affine relationship is an in-plane rotation. So an affine transformation has six parameters. We're just doing a search for the six parameters that minimize the difference between these two images. And you can see in the middle that the coordinates have just sort of rotated. Okay, let's go back to Keynote. Go push play again. Uh, the nonlinear example, which I showed before, um, the main difference here is that you just glue in a different deformation model. Everything else is basically the same. Uh, nonlinear image registration is not as robust as the linear image registration. Um, uh, by by nonlinear and linear, I mean the deformation model. So if you have a cubic spline model with 100 parameters, it's much harder to optimize that than it is to optimize an affine model which has six parameters. So this is sort of the future, or the perceived future of the project. Um, we have lots of wants. Um, there's already been a fair bit of work on feature-based registration, which is very, very fast. There's a direct linear solution if you've got corresponding features between two images. Uh, that's largely been implemented, but not really tightly integrated yet. Uh, there's some work from uh, contributor Rian van den Doel, uh, who's been working on automatic feature detection. So the idea there would be if you have a feature-based registration algorithm and you have an automatic feature detector and matcher, you don't have to have anybody controlling it. You just run these things. That's particularly good for um, video stabilization, for example. Uh, th this is sort of repeating myself a bit. We've got similarity metrics and deformation models that we want to throw into the package. Uh, my idea of version 1.0 would be something that's integrated with uh, a scikit known as scikit image, which is basically like an image processing uh, package which is going to be sort of tacked onto the side of SciPy. Uh, you know, I, I, do, I do know a little bit about testing and I do want to have 
complete code coverage of this package to give people confidence if they're going to go and manipulate things inside it, try to improve it, speed it up, for example. Once again, if you're interested in image registration, please read these two papers. Uh, the final paper is, is all about uh, really interesting uh, deformation models, so the cubic spline uh, deformation model and how you would fit that. Uh, that's basically the nonlinear registration example I showed. I can, yeah, I can make it available. Yep. Maybe tweak the link to the paper. Tweak the link to the two um, articles to the micro hashtag. Sure. Um, and please follow my project. Have a look. Uh, if you want to see how, uh, I don't know, maybe a crazy person tries to implement these algorithms, check out my code and read through it. Um, oh, I should, I should actually say that it's not all my code. I actually do have um, two contributors who are making um, lots of developments uh, in addition to myself. Uh, that would be um, Rian van der Doel and uh, Stefan van der Waal. And they're, they're mostly um, very interested in the feature-based registration right now. Uh, I should thank my colleagues at BOM. That's, that's basically the end. So, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of this work's actually really difficult to get off the ground at the Bureau because it's not very simple to get an open source project going. It takes quite a lot of meetings and quite a lot of emails. So I should thank um, Tennessee for being involved in organising a, um, a lot of that stuff. Uh, I should thank Brianna and uh, Damien and Gary and John for being actively involved in some of this work as well basically telling me not to put equations in my presentation was a good idea. So if there's any questions. How much of this stuff is actually in use now at the Bureau? Are you using it at all or is it a, you know, would like to use it? Yeah, this, this started as a, um, a part-time project that I had going. Um, and we, we do plan to use image registration pretty heavily uh, in the future. It's pretty much the next big chunk of my work at the Bureau. Hi, thanks for the talk. Is there any data available from the Bureau which is available for public use? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure. I can't answer that right now. But, uh, you know, in terms of maybe numerical weather prediction output, you, you can see like the access models and the output um, from the Bureau website. I'm not sure if you can get to the raw fields, um, but, but I could find out. Uh, double barrel question. Um, from what I understand, um, the, the original data that you're working with is not really this nice smooth field that your illustration shows. Yep. It's really data that was collected at individual places and individual times and then assimilated through an assimilation model. So is there any way that you can actually go back into that data and register it from one, from one assimilation period to another, or is that a much harder problem? So it is a much harder problem. Uh, basically, I'm looking at the output of the numerical weather prediction model. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that numerical weather prediction is basically an aggregation of observations and things, and they go through a really complex process mm -hmm. to generate some fields. Um, the answer is no, I haven't considered any of that really okay. yet. I did have a second question, and that, that might be easy to answer. Um, it, is it useful to have... Um, more general non-linear solvers at the back end or is this uh, such a, a unique problem that it has to have its own type of non-linear solution? Uh, it's a good, that's a good question. Basically, w when I started working on this, I picked up the SciPy, uh, you know, non-linear solvers and I tried to use them and it's possible to use those general solvers for this problem. It's not a unique problem. It's a non-linear least squares problem. It's been solved. Um, but to really understand what's going on at every iteration, I wanted to be able to like put shortcuts in and, and print out things and stuff like that. And I just found that too difficult using the existing sci-fi stuff. So I went and implemented it myself. Uh, maybe that's reinventing the wheel, but I completely understand absolutely everything that's going on. And that's something I was really looking for in this case. 
Hi, really interesting talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, are there any alternative libraries for doing uh, <coughs> image registration, such as you know something in C or, or something like that, or are you the main event at this point? That's that's a loaded question. I know that one for sure. Is definitely the answer is yes. So there, there's existing, um, uh, you know, there, there are very good existing C libraries for image registration that exist. Particularly the ones that come to mind are the Insight Registration Toolkit, IRTK, ITK. Um, they come from the medical imaging sort of domain. Uh, so they do have Python bindings, but I'm sort of approaching this problem in, with the mindset that I'm going to manipulate the algorithms that I'm using. So I might not necessarily want to use exactly the same image registration algorithms that are available. And that's why I've implemented Python register. And in the process, I've implemented some algorithms that are, I think, much easier to understand than to drill down to the bottom of using like a complex C, C binding, for example. Um, one thing I should note is that all of this stuff, really, except for the sampler, is just NumPy and SciPy. So it's extremely easy for someone to pick up, read, and understand. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, just, I guess, a quick question, or perhaps if I could perhaps get you just to say a little bit about how you know when a solution is actually good. Uh, okay. Um, so, I mean, you you have a solver that was, is going to have some sense of goodness of fit, but aside from that, presumably that's different for the different models, so it's hard to compare from yeah. one family of model to another. Yeah, to go into the details, basically um, when you're turning the wheel on the nonlinear optimization, you, you know, one very simple way that you know that you've converged is that the change in the parameter set gets smaller and smaller. So you can threshold that and say, once your delta on the parameter set gets below a particular threshold, maybe like one to the negative four or something, or 10 to the negative four, sorry. Um, that's when you stop iterating. That's when you stop turning the wheel. Is that a measure of success or it's a, it's a measure of convergence, I guess. So, okay, the questions are getting more difficult. But, like, <laughs> um, uh, another, another thing that we do um, is, well, that I do in, in, in the solver is I'm using basically a modified gradient descent algorithm. And I'm keeping track of the bad iterations. And so the bad iterations are when you take a step and the error doesn't decrease, it increases. And the idea there is that you can backtrack. So if you have a step and your error actually increases, what you want to do is say, I don't want to take that step. I want to take a bigger step and hope that the error decreases. And so um, the idea there is that you keep this count of the number of bad iterations, so the number of times that your error has actually increased and then you stop iterating when the error just keeps on increasing. That's basically what I do right now. Yeah, there, there are many, many nonlinear solvers that you could try it. Hey, uh, so the idea is to take the source image and deform it to the target image. And I guess implicit in that, you come up with a path as well. Yeah, so uh, I guess if you wanted to think of it like you... Because we want to go halfway or three quarters or... Yeah, so, so when, I, when I've been talking about um, weighted averaging with advection, basically what I do in that case is I say deform from point A to point B, okay, and give me the deformation field that goes from point A to point B. Now just halve the magnitude of that deformation field and that says this is the deformation to the midpoint. And then I transform point, well, the image data at point A to the midpoint. And I use the inverse to transform the image data at point B to the midpoint. And then you compute the average. And that's why the result actually looks pretty good. Because when you do this advection, basically you can introduce artifacts. So you can pull in pixels from the boundaries and things like that. Um, but if you do the averaging, you can wash out those artifacts. And that's basically why the method works pretty well. Okay, we'll just do one last question. Thanks. Uh, do you always get the global minima or get stuck oh, in the local minima? There's a few optimization minima? people in the crowd. Um, <laughs> so I didn't do a PhD in optimization theory or anything like that. But basically, um, you know, we just have an estimate. It's not guaranteed to be the global minimum. 
it's a minimum. That, that's all I'm going to say on that one. So, Nathan, thank you for an excellent talk. Cheers. And if everyone can please show their appreciation for Nathan.